Good uh, morning, everybody. Welcome once again to the JKMRC Friday Seminar Series. On behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to acknowledge the Turbul and Yoga people as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections with country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker this morning is our very own Dr. Susanna Brito Yabrio, a research fellow here at the JKMRC. Susanna has a background in chemical engineering and completed her PhD in minerals engineering at the WALK, a centre of excellence for research into chemistry and physics at the interfaces at the University of South Australia. She has a particular interest in the complex interplay between ore mineralogy, mineral surface properties and ore behaviour during processing and has focused her research on investigating how surface chemistry drives mineral flotation and how a better understanding of surface properties can be used to devise solutions to improve separation efficiency. In this morning's talk, Susanna will be taking us down into the realm of mineral surface characterization and showing our recent advances in a suite of microanalytical techniques, time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and atomic force microscopy, Microscopy can be used to acquire mineral-specific surface chemistry information from complex mineral text mixtures, and how that data can be used to better understand flotation characteristics of complex ores. Her presentation today is titled Advanced Surface Characterization, the Next Frontier in Minerals Research. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. Susanna Brito Iabriu. Thanks, Tom. For the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and share with you uh, my research. Um, the topic today is an area that I'm particularly passionate about. So yeah, very happy to be here. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about advanced surface characterization, uh, the next frontier in minerals research. Not going to the next one. Um, so before I launch into my presentation, I will give you a brief introduction about myself. Uh, so my name is Susana Brito Abreu. Uh, I am from Portugal, uh, where I did my degree in chemical engineering, specialized in industry. Uh, after I graduated, I had a few years of experience both in industry uh, and research. Uh, that really spiked my interest for research. Uh, and then I came to Australia in 2008 and I pursued my PhD uh, in minerals engineering at the work. Uh, this is where I specialized in the application of surface analysis uh, in mineral processing studies. Um, I joined the JKMRC in 2018. Uh, first, I joined the separation group led by Kim Rangi. Uh, and then more recently, uh, Lisa and I formed the flotation chemistry group, which I am now part of. Uh, so my research areas uh, are mineral processing chemistry, novel reagents, and mineral surface analysis. So this is a brief outline of my talk today. I will first give you a brief introduction about surface science in mineral processing, then I'll give you some examples of application uh, and some case studies and future directions where to from now. So very briefly, uh, spe specifically for those who are not very familiar, uh, this is the mineral processing stages. Uh, first, we need mining to remove the ore from the ground. Uh, then we need to break up the rocks into small particles uh, to a small enough size so we can separate them. We can separate via flotation or leaching or bio-leaching. Flotation is the most common application um, separation um, process. So let's have a look at mineral separation uh, in a snapshot. We first need to break up the rocks into small particles. Uh, small enough down to the micrometer size so we can liberate them. Uh, then these particles are then going into a flotation tank 
uh, where they are mixed with water and air and also flotation reagents, uh, which we use to alter the surface chemistry of the minerals so that we can achieve selective separation. Uh, and then we collect at the top the concentrate, which is concentrated in developable minerals, uh, and the waste remains uh, in water. So let's have a look into more detail about um, the flotation process. Let's zoom in to the flotation tank and look at um, how particles interact with bubbles. Um, so here we can see an air bubble surrounded by small mineral particles attached to it. For this process to uh, happen and to occur efficiently, uh, three sub processes need to happen. First, the particles need to collide with the bubble. Uh, and then they need to be sufficiently hydrophobic to be attached to the bubble. Uh, and then they need to resist all the turbulence in the system uh, and do not detach from the bubble until they reach to the top of the flotation cell. So the probability of collecting a mineral particle is then the product of the probability of collision, attachment, and one minus detachment. Now, what I wanted to point out here, oh, before I, did, I go into that, um, well, I can, I can show this. Um, what I wanted to point out here is that um, the surface chemistry has a key role specifically in the process of attachment and detachment. Um, so a, um, the hydrophobicity of the mineral particles is driven mainly by surface chemistry. Uh, and the particles need to be strongly attached to the um, bubble so that they don't detach. Now, the detachment is also influenced by the hydrodynamic conditions inside the flotation cell. So both uh, will affect the detachment. So, like, for example, let's say, oh, this is not working. A particle collides with the bubble, attaches, but then the turbulence is too high and it will detach. So this particle won't be recovered. So a little bit about flotation reagents, very briefly. Um, there are three main flotation reagents that we use. We use collectors to increase mineral hydrophobicity if we want to recover those minerals. Uh, if we don't want to recover, we use the presence, which makes them hydrophilic, that is attractive to water, so they don't attach to the bubbles. Uh, and we use frothers to prevent bubble breakup, reduce bubble size and stabilize the froth. Now I've talked about hydrophobicity. What is hydrophobicity? This is a property of surfaces uh, that tells us whether a material likes water or not. So hydro from the Greek means water and phobos means fear. So fear of water, in other words, water repellent. And this is the spectrum um, of the range of hydrophobicities that we can have. On the left-hand side, we have a complete wetting uh, behavior where the liquid uh, likes the surface, wets on the, uh, spreads on the surface. And on the right-hand side, uh, we have, on the right-hand side, we have um, complete non-wetting where the, the surface is highly hydrophobic. So it doesn't like the surface, therefore the liquid adopts a spherical shape. Uh, so how do we measure hydrophobicity? Through contact angle. When we place a liquid droplet on the surface, uh, the droplet forms a given shape. And that shape uh, allows us to, that shape allows us to calculate this angle at the three-phase contact point. Uh, this is to do with the balance of forces acting on this point. Uh, and from that, we can, we can say that the angle of contact is the, um, the surface property that we are uh, wanting to determine. This is the very famous Young's equation. Uh, in practice, we use the contact angle instrument. This is the one we have in our labs. Uh, it's very simple. It's an optical method. We place the surface um, 
on the platform, uh, we have a syringe above where we dispense um, liquid droplets, uh, and then we capture um, the videos or the photos with a high resolution camera. Um, using this device, uh, there's actually different ways of measuring the contact angle we can do. Uh, using the sessile drop method, we place a liquid droplet on the surface um, and okay. Yes, I need to go out of the point there. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, it can look something like this. We increase the uh, droplet size until it attaches to the surface. Um, and then through this method, we can also increase the volume of the liquid droplet and calculate the water advancing contact angle. I'll talk a little bit more about this. This is an important uh, measurement. We can also do the captive bubble method where uh, we have an air bubble in water and the surface immersed in water. Uh, and then we approach the air bubble to the surface uh, and measure the contact angle. This is actually more uh, similar to what happened in a flotation context. What I noticed, this is a video that uh, my PhD student Enwen captured. Uh, I found very interesting that, and I will play it again so you can uh, have a better look. When you release the bubble and the bubble feels the surface first and then finds the optimal point to attach. So it's not like an immediate process. And I think this is very much what may happen in a real flotation uh, cell, and especially for coarse particles where the particles are the particle surfaces are larger than the air bubbles. Uh, so let's have a look again. There, that's the white spot. So uh, anyway, that's very interesting studies that we can do, which enables us to really look deeply into the mechanisms of particle and bubble interactions. Oh, not again. So uh, now I'm going to talk about contact angle hysteresis. What is this? So surfaces are not ideal. They can uh, be chemical heterogeneous, which is the case for particles poorly liberated, especially uh, in our case. Um, and they can have also uh, roughness on the surfaces. These two uh, characteristics will interfere uh, the contact angle. Now, um, mineral surfaces have both of these and they are also reactive, which makes you know, the study even more complex. Despite that, we are actually doing a good job at actually understanding what's going on on the surfaces. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here is that when you conduct advancing contact angles and the receding contact angles, which is the opposite when the, uh, the bubble or the um, droplet recedes over the surface, uh, the difference between these two values actually tells us something about the chemical heterogeneity uh, of the surfaces. Uh, well, it could also be roughness, but you know, since chemical heterogeneity is what varies most and we don't have any control over roughness, uh, let's focus on chemical heterogeneity. Um, so the higher the chemical heterogeneity, the larger will be the difference between the advancing and receiving. So why is this important in the mineral processing context? Um, we have seen that recovery depends on the hydrophobicity of the mineral particles, and the hydrophobicity in turn depends on the surface chemistry of the mineral particles. So these uh, properties are all linked. How we determine 
mineral surface chemistry through surface analysis. And how do we determine idofibricity? I have just shown you through contact angle measurement. So this ends the beginning of my talk where I will just give you a brief introduction about surf, um, surface science. Now I'm going to give you some examples of applications. I'm going to start by uh, this surface analytical technique, TOF-SIMS, which stands for Time of Flight Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometry. Uh, this is a technique where a material is bombarded by an energetic ion beam. And the, this impact will create a cascade of collisions between the atoms on the surface. Uh, and oh, I need to point that again for those online, sorry. And so upon the impact, this cascade of collisions will cause the bond between the atoms to break. As a result, uh, particles will be released. Near the center, the energy is stronger, so mostly elements are emitted. Then as we go farther away, ions um, and small molecule fragments will be released. And as we go farther away, well, more uh, heavier you know, molecules will then be released. Uh, these are called the secondary particles that are emitted. These sec secondary particles are then accelerated to possess the same kinetic energy before entering this tube. So they will fly through this tube and they are going to fly with a velocity proportional to the mass. So the heavier particles will take longer to arrive at the detector. And so by, now, by detecting the different times, uh, we will record a mass spectrum of the particles. So what, can this, what information can we obtain from here? This is an example of a picture of chocolate particles uh, in a complex mixture of minerals in an ore. And it shows here on the left, a fairly liberated particle and on the right, eh, poorly liberated particle here at the top, mm, very poorly liberated. But we can see uh, what are the, the surface species, elements in this case, that are on the surface. And this is very important for us to know because this is going to drive the interaction with air bubbles. So through this technique, uh, we will analyze only the outermost surface layers, about one to two atomic layers on the surface. And we can detect uh, species uh, at very low concentrations down to PPB. Um, we can generate a map of chemical elements, could be of chemical composition, could be elements, could be small molecules such as collector molecules, uh, or could be other ion species. Uh, it could also be isotopes. But the most um, powerful capability of this technique is the ability to, to do this and be, able, and be able to select regions of interest from the image and collect the chemistry information just for those. And that enables us to acquire surface chemistry information specific to particles or mineral phases in complex mineral mixtures, which is very valuable for our studies. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples of the application of this technique in mineral processing studies. Let's first have a look at using this technique to determine the microscopic hydrophobicity on mineral surfaces. This is some work that I did uh, during my PhD. I used uh, methylated quartz surfaces to study the relationship between the contact angle and the tof sim signals uh, that we could acquire from those surfaces. So you can see here 
on the right hand side this graph that shows the relationship between the advancing and the receding contact angles uh, as we increase the hydrophobizing agent um, on the surfaces. And you can see it's a very good correlation. Now, from these correlations, I was able to extract a model, uh, a simple equation. Um, and applying this equation back to the images, we could then produce a map of the microscopic hydrophobicity along a particle surface. In this case, it's this particle here, a 16, uh, 16 micrometers long. And you can see that even on a simple system with just a quartz and an hydrophobizing agent, the variation at the micrometer level, the variation of contact angle is significant, which explains the complexity of the flotation process where we have many, many other chemical species interfering. The other thing that we could also do by following this procedure on a different system, in this case for a pyrite particle, was to have a look at the coarse particle um, and determine the hydrophobicity at, on different faces of the particle. What it was very interesting to see was that if you have a look at the top face has an average contact angle of 68, this side face here of 77, but along the edge is the lowest with 61. This actually is, very, is a very interesting result because we know that on edges, they are more reactive because the bonds are broken. They are more prone to reactions to oxidize. And so it was very interesting to actually see on the edge, we actually observed that on a chemical perspective. Why is this important? Especially as we are, you know, uh, developing our understanding of coarse particle flotation, it's important that we understand and we are able to actually uh, produce this information. Um, so just to summarize, the, the method uh, has really um, significant advantages for our studies. Uh, it enables us to calculate individual, to analyze individual particles in mineral mixtures. Um, the method is independent on particle size, uh, and that is very uh, handy because, you know, washboard methods to determine contact angle of uh, particles uh, is limited to a certain size. It can be used for particles or flat surfaces and does not require any pretreatments, such as the washburn. Uh, that's for those who are familiar. Uh, so let's have a look. Let's apply this knowledge to study the hydrophobicity distribution in flotation streams. Um, I developed this model to predict the contact angle of chacopyrite particles uh, with a diethylphosphate collector. And you can see in this equation, the key toxins ion signals are the oxygen for overall oxidation, the sulfur and the collector fragment. When we apply this and look back into the images, we are able to calculate the individual particle contact angle. This is like, this is critical. This is the only way we can actually find out this information. And when we apply these in flotation streams, we can find out interesting things. This is an example of a concentrate sample uh, where I analyzed the chocopyre particles by size in like three size ranges. Uh, which I will call it the, in, the fine, intermediate, and coarse. What you can see is that, very interestingly, the intermediate ones have the lowest hydrophobicity, followed by the fine. And lastly, the coarse, they need to have the highest hydrophobicity of all. 
This actually is very consistent with the recovery curves. And for those who are familiar, know that dot fine and coarse particles are the most disadvantages uh, because, well, fine particles, they have lower collision probability and coarse particles, they are heavy. So they have higher detachment probability. So this was, you know, very interesting to find. Um, I will also show you briefly a study uh, on the grinding conditions and the effect on the oxidation of pyrite particles. This was work done by Shi Hong Shu, um, who did his PhD at the at the end work, uh, well now the Future Industries Institute, and I was co-supervising him with Professor Bill Skinner. What he did was he developed a model, a top symbols model for pyrite particles. And then uh, he looked at um, the pyrite ground with different grinding environments. He used forged steel versus high chrome steel. And he also used air versus nitrogen gas. What he found was that during, well, he could not only the, uh, see the evolution of the oxidation over time for each of those conditions, as you can see in these graphs, but he could also uh, confirm that indeed the forged steel is the condition that leads to higher oxidation. Uh, and on the other hand, if we use high chrome and nitrogen gas, it preserves the mineral surfaces uh, and doesn't let them oxidize. So that was a very interesting study. And now I'm going to show you a case study where we worked here in a team in a big study uh, at the, um, to diagnose and optimize um, the uh, pre-flotation circuit at Mount Isa copper concentrator. So just to give you a brief introduction uh, about um, the case, so uh, they employ a pre-flotation circuit prior to the main circuit because they have talc in the ore. Talc no floats naturally, so they need to remove it uh, prior to the main circuit. Um, so the talc separation is not complete. It's, it's still recovered in the final concentrate. The charcoal part is also recovered uh, with talc in the pre-flotation circuit and therefore is lost to the final term. So the goal was to maximize the top recovery while minimizing copper losses. So what we did was a comprehensive analysis of the flotation mechanisms, where we conducted a circuit survey, MLA, um, mineral liberation analysis, flotation modeling, JK, using JK SimFlow. This was then work done by Kim. Uh, and we also looked at top steam's analysis to uh, examine the mineral surfaces. I am going to point out, oh, oh yeah, that's the, right. So um, flotation modeling shows that the talc floats very fine, slowly and is incomplete. And the charcoal pyrite floats by true flotation and not by entrainment, which was hypothesized uh, at the beginning. Um, so we conducted surface analysis to determine the flotation chemistry drivers. Uh, when we looked at um, the concentrate versus the tail samples um, collected from the plant, we found that there is collector molecules on the um, charcoal pirate particles that floated. Now, in that part of the circuit, no reagents are added because they don't want to recover charcoal pirate, they just want to remove talc. So th therefore, the, the collector was coming from the processed water as a residual reagent. So then this led to our optimization strategy strategy, let's remove the residual collector from the particle surfaces. So uh, our team led by Lisa went, um, flew to Mount Isa, went to their labs, processed a lot of samples and flotation tests, took also samples for surface analysis. And what we found was that um, comparing the before and after treatment, uh, indeed, 
sorry. Indeed, uh, we did have a reduction in collector on the charcoal pirate surface heat. But it was interesting that we found at the same time, it was also, uh, there was also an increase in the oxidation, but that's not surprising because we heated uh, the processed water and so that heating uh, caused some oxidation. That's okay. In this case, we had a dual um, effect on the um, portability of charcoal pyrite. When we compare the, re the recovery results, uh, we can see that there is a clear decrease in copper losses by 67%. Uh, and this is not attributed to entrainment. This was attributed to a reduction in photability. Uh, and you can see here in the, in the um, uh, selectivity curves that there was an improvement in the selectivity between chocopara and talc without detrimental effect on the talc recovery. Okay, uh, just to, um, so this was good finding. However, in practice, it's not really feasible to apply the treatment process that we used in the lab. So um, we would, they would need to look into rerouting alternatives or other you know, ways of treating the, the water and removing a residual collector. Now, I am going to briefly introduce another technique, um, another surface analytical technique as well, which is the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy or XPS for short. Um, just very briefly again, um, this is a technique some of you might be familiar with. Uh, a sample is um, from irradiated by X-rays, particularly aluminum K-alpha X-rays. Uh, and then the photoelectrons are emitted from the, from the surface uh, and the kinetic energy of those is measured. And then it, depending on the binding energy of uh, these photoelectrons, uh, we can identify the chemical species and the state of oxidation as well. Um, it enables, the, the good part of this technique is that it enables a quantification of the surface species. Um, the limitation on the other hand is it can be used on single minerals or let's say high grade samples, but we cannot really use it on mineral mixtures because we don't have that capability of choosing uh, the areas of interest. Nevertheless, uh, it can give us um, other types of information very useful. In this case, I am showing you uh, how we used um, XPS to study collector absorption uh, with varying collector concentration. And you can see here in this graph how the elemental composition varies as we increase collector concentration. So in this case, if we're using a collector, obviously we have an increase in carbon. So therefore, yes, we can see that there is a definite increase in carbon. Uh, we can also see from here, what is the minimum uh, concentration we need to achieve the maximum or almost maximum recovery. And, and so this is very useful information. Um, the, the interesting part here is how we can correlate this information with XPS to have a better comprehensive um, data. And this is some of the work that we are doing and will be continuing to do into the future. Another interesting technique is atomic force microscopy. Um, this is, oh, well, I, I will, um, Introduce later. So this technique, uh, what it does is it uses uh, a cantilever with a tip at the end of the cantilever. Now there is a laser beam pointing at the cantilever. And so as the cantilever moves over the surface and feels the surface, uh, it deflects the light. And so that deflection is then converted into an image of topography of the sample. So we can actually see all the bumps and the roughness on the surface, and we can quantify that roughness. Uh, another interesting capability of this technique is that it enables us to measure the force between the surface uh, and the probe. Uh, 
Uh, and this is some work in progress that we are currently doing, uh, but that's where we are heading to. Um, so this is part of Enran New. She is uh, my PhD student within the Center of Excellence um, for Eco Efficient Beneficiation of Minerals. And what um, she is, uh, this is a joint project between us and the University of South Australia um, with Bill and Martin, where she is looking at applying this technique to look at the uh, surface mineral surfaces and understand the effect of chemical heterogeneity, both in terms of topography as well as in terms of interaction forces. Here on the left, you can see an image uh, after collector has been absorbed onto the surface, and you can see it's relatively homogeneous and very well packed. Uh, it can also give us information about the level of, um, of the height uh, of those areas, which is you know, the, the coverage on the surface. On the right-hand side here, we have an image of the topography for a mineral surface that has been oxidized for quite some time. And you can, we can see actually these lumps here uh, from oxidation products. So that actually enables us to understand when we, you know, when a surface changes under certain conditions, what's the effect on topography, right? uh, which will then interact also with, you know, how we measure contact angles, how uh, the surface interacts with bubbles and so on. So, in summary, we have seen that contact angle measurements provide useful information about the interfacial behavior at specifically in the three phase systems, uh, as it is our case. We will continue to advance our understanding of the information we acquire from these methods and how it relates uh, to flotation uh, response. We have seen that uh, TOF sims analysis enables us to acquire particle specific information within mineral mixtures. Uh, and that has many applications across different stages of mineral processing. Uh, we, we have also seen that uh, we can produce TOF sims contact angle models that enables us to look at individual particles and calculate. The, their individual contact angles, as well as the distribution of hydrophobicities in flotation streams. Um, also, how contact angle varies across a particle surface, and this is very pertinent to coarse particle flotation. Uh, we have seen that XPS enables us to quantify elemental composition and give us uh, very important information about absorption of uh, reagents on the surfaces, uh, and this is very useful. Uh, to determine uh, mean uh, concentration required, as well as giving us insights into the binding mechanisms. And atomic force microscopy gives us important information about the, the, the topography of the surfaces uh, and also interaction forces between surfaces uh, and bubbles. Uh, we will have a better understanding into the mechanisms of collector absorption and the effect of oxidation when we apply this technique. So just to finish my talk, future directions. So where to from here? Um, well, to understand uh, the mechanisms driving flotation performance, flotation, grinding, uh, we need to fully understand the minerals behavior at the three phase system. To fully understand this behavior, we need to combine different analytical techniques and develop an understanding of the information we obtain for real mineral systems. Many of these techniques have been, no, these techniques have been used in many other studies, but really understanding the information we acquire for our real mineral systems, uh, that is something we are developing now. And so, by knowing then, we will know how to best combine this information to have a comprehensive um, information about the behavior of mineral surfaces. Um, so advancing this mineral surface characterization will um, allow us 
to advance also the fundamental understanding of these systems, uh, but with a direct application in mineral processing studies. Lastly, I don't have to talk about this today, maybe sometime in the future, but on top of this, if we also combine this information with 3D information from X-ray tomography, then we will be able to link mineralogy with surface characteristics, which will also enhance our understanding of complex um, mineral systems, as well as exploring new avenues uh, in the geology space and in conversations we need. We have found many opportunities to look into that and really looking forward to this work. Um, so with, with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, all of these people from, he, from here, our team, uh, from Mount Isa Mines and also the UNISA team and the Center of Excellence for Eco Efficient Beneficiation of Minerals. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, we have time for some questions. Lisa. This isn't a question. Uh, Susanna, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I, I cannot express just how happy I am to see this level of scientific advancement to really show its promise in our ability to treat and process real world systems. In flotation for so many decades, we have based our understanding of chemistry and how chemistry operates on external observation of bulk systems, strictly looking at grades and recoveries and only hypothesizing about how chemistry operates. The development of surface medical techniques have then led us to the point where we could look at ideal surfaces and improve our ability to hypothesize about this. But the advent of these systems spearheaded by Susanna is really, really bringing us into the area where we can truly see what's happening on the surfaces. And we can, for the first time in many, many years of flotation research history, really see what it is that we're doing and the effects that we are having on our minerals and correlate them to overall bulk flotation resources. So th this is the best time ever to be a flotation chemistry researcher. <laughs> uh, they are. Susanna, that was a superb presentation, um, really well pegged to a general audience, so I could actually understand most of it, but I got confused by one thing, so which I'd really like to understand a little better. Can you go back to your slide 27, uh, which was relating the measurements of uh, contact angle fit? Just go back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that one there. So um, I'm really interested for you to just go through and explain that a bit more slowly because to me it looks backwards to to um, what you were saying there because on the recovery curve on the right, the intermediate particles are the ones that are getting recovered the most e easily, but they're the ones with who are the most hydrophilic. So I'm a bit confused. So. Yeah, so here, these particles, by size, they are uh, the most advantageous to be recovered because they have the optimum size range. So therefore, they don't need to be as much as hydrophobic as compared to, whoops, sorry, as compared to um, the fine particles and the coarse particles. But, also, what's interesting is that coarse particles, we know that because they are heavy, they have higher probability of detection from the bubble. So they are, comparing to the fine particles, they are more poorly recovered. Uh, therefore, what we found was that actually the particles that were recovered in this range had a higher hydrophobicity because for them to be recovered and to survive the turbulence in the system and be recovered, they actually needed to have a stronger hydrophobicity compared to the other ones to survive you know, 
to the end of the process. And that's what we saw. Right, thanks. Pretty much my, we had the same problem. I had the same issue as we are here. <laughs> so I actually, yes, I think commenting back to everybody else, I think this is one of the best presentation I saw from the Friday seminars. Mm -hmm, this one essentially that curve is the interplay between hydrophobicity and turbulence, the way I understand it, isn't it? Yeah. Because in my mind, always when I've basically learned a little bit of flotation, I knew that actually fines and the course normally are not recovered because of the turbulence that exists in the in the flotation cells. So they detach de generally. And if I want to understand it correctly, so what you're saying here is the ones that they are recover. For fines uh, for coarse particles, they have to be higher hydro hydrophobicity to be able to be recovered. Yeah. Uh, but for the middle size, it doesn't uh, like they don't have to be uh, yeah, because highly hydrophobic yeah. because they yeah. can be recovered. That's right. It's a balance between size and surface properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and if they have the optimum size, they no they are in other. Yeah, they don't need to be as hydrophobic. Yes. So, uh, but the fines and the cores, if they want to be recovered, they have to be highly hydrophobic. Yes. So those are the particles that actually they were floated, and then you you measure the recovered and the concentrate. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Not excessive. Sorry, I'm very glad that this is being brought up because this is something that we in our group have been banging on about for quite some time. Is that looking at hydrodynamic and chemical factors in isolation? leads us to not knowing enough about the system. The two are inextricably linked and need to be considered together. Oh, sorry, Kim, I have my hand up. We can leave the elephant in the room, maybe. <laughs> um, so one other thing, and it was great to see the mention of geology, but uh, one thing in the, in the communication and breakage space that I see us going to is the way in which uh, fractures are occurring along grain boundaries and using these techniques to really accurately map what is going on at a grain boundary that we have not really done before. And uh, I'm going to be intrigued to see where that goes um, because we know really very little about what goes on at grain boundaries. Um, and it's also really important in the exploration space when it comes to weathering of the rocks, releasing particles into the, the water column and so forth that you actually see in exploration. So uh, I see us doing lots of things in that space. We all look forward to getting the new machine this year. Yes, <laughs> yes that's right. December 18th. <laughs> okay, party time. Oh, I just wanted to add one more thing to this because, yeah, it is size and it is chemistry, but it's also liberation because um, I keep seeing the elephant curve and I can tell you the elephant curve is very different depending on what liberation class that you have. It's flat if you're liberated. So if you're liberated, you float. If you don't, you're not liberated, you don't float and you get a very different curve. Um, and so I think what I'm really excited about is this ability to link TOF sims and tomography because if we can start to look at both liberation as well, because some of the work we did at Olympic Dam, not being able to differentiate between that and particles really undermined our ability to, to really understand what chemistry was doing in that system. So that's where I think I'm, I'm really excited by the work. <laughs> cool. Actually, that was my second question on this curve. So we have a distribution of contact angle for each of the sizes as well. Is that true that actually that's going to be correlated with liberation of those particles as well? In this case, this was a single mineral study, so they were liberated. But um, I would like really to you know have the opportunity to um, study okay. an, an ore system and look at different, and we could do studies like, you know, even not just for one available mineral, but what's going on with the other minerals and uh, with complex particles, coarse particles, yeah, lots of interesting studies that we can do in this space. Yeah. 
We uh, have an online question from Craig Brown. He says, uh, thanks, Susanna. The readily measurable pulp chemistry characteristics in testing and operations are EH and pH. How can these be related and therefore manipulated to optimum particle surface condition for flotation response? Uh, I get lost, but we can hear a little bit. Uh, thanks, Craig, for your question. And you know, thanks for attending my talk, by the way. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, in in plant operations it is more difficult to control, especially EH, uh, but also it's um, in a complex system is also a, a combination of all mineralogy, process water effects, uh, everything together. So that would be a matter of actually going into you know, a specific plant uh, and look at you know, a specific part of the circuit and have a diagnostic assessment of what's going on and then you know what are the key drivers and how we can you know manipulate them so yeah that's what i'll say and uh, just a reminder if you any online viewers have any questions please just raise your hand in the chat uh, and i can you can ask the question live or type it into the q a box do you have any more questions from the floor yes uh, thank you for your talk. It was really cool as a plantation person to listen to all of this. What I wanted to ask is that you mentioned the um, project for Mount Isa and that the solution which you found by now is heating is not really implementary for the process. Have you been thinking for alternative ways? Maybe any work has been done in this direction or? No, no we have. Oh, well, Tim, yes. What we, suggest, what we suggested to them was actually to look at their process water because their process water was coming straight back into the process, which meant it didn't have time to degrade the reagents, whereas we thought maybe if they let it go out to the tailing stand under the sun, yeah. <laughs> deteriorate, come back, then maybe they'd get less recovery. But they didn't kind of pursue that one because the pumping and everything was going to be really expensive for them and the talc had stopped coming through the plants. So <laughs> it wasn't as big an issue, but that will, that there are other alternatives like that. Uh, but even though at the time this wasn't pursued further, we are getting an increasing number of inquiries as the requirement to have higher recycling rates for processed water are increasing due to our necessity of being more, more um, conservative with our water use, we are actually starting to get a lot of inquiries about specifically looking at the effects of recycled water on um, and the effect of um, residual reagents. And we're in the middle of scoping a project of a large size to look at that. In terms of um, flotation and micas, micaceous minerals like talc and chlorite and things like that. Is there a really good set of data about contact angles and top sims and relationships in flotation systems to that? Or do we know, do we actually know much about it? Because it's certainly important in the predictive space because we, we know what it is from the MLA side or something like that. But I don't know. All I hear is that chloride and talc are really bad. So the short answer is no, we don't have any database of that information, but that is what we are planning to slowly, case by case, start to build uh, and start to have a, you know, predictive capability given, you know, certain conditions. So, so yeah, that's where we're heading. To add to that, um, most of what we know about the flotation of the so-called problematic um, phyllosilicates, primarily talc, we know from industrial experience just how much of a problem that they cause. In terms of the contact angles on different faces of talc, we are basically working off, I think, a 25-year-old paper by Doug Foster now who showed that there's a difference in contact angle between the basal planes and the faces, and that's pretty much all we had for a while until um, currently within the center of excellence, we are looking at a project that is characterizing the degree of morphological change within talc minerals and their effect on floatability. And I look forward to our ability to then go to those surfaces and look at 
the complexities of the surface heterotropicity as a function of morphological change, which is something that we have a chance of doing within the center of excellence for eco-efficient beneficiation of minerals, um, something that we are all proud to be a part of. Well, we have another online question just popped in uh, from an anonymous attendee. Is there an analytical technique to measure hydrophobicity over a whole particle rather than over a flat surface? No, not that I know of. I, I have a question actually that's somewhat related, but uh, do you see a, for, for minerals that have a strong anisotropy, say phytosilicates or, you know, molybdenite or something like that, do you see a strong or any significant difference in properties between one crystal face versus another fracture plane? I haven't that? studied that, but that would be very interesting. I would really look forward to studying that. Well, I thought that question was a good question. Mm. But I didn't like the answer. <laughs> so, I mean, I thought it was a very fair question. Would you like to? Well, the, very, the question was, if you know the distribution of hydrophobicity over a particle, then is there some overall measure of hydrophobicity of that particle, which you sort of said no. And I thought that was a good question and it could have had a better answer. Well, I don't know of any technique that enables uh, to determine the contact angle of a single middle particle. But that's not the question. I think I got the question. If there is a, a technique that enables to determine the contact angle. We're talking about this. Yes. Well, okay. Well, well that's what all the question was. It's an but I, I thought he was saying that if you have a distribution of hydrophobicity over the particle, what is the hydrophobicity of that particle? Should be some number which should be described to that particle? Well, we can, as I've shown you, uh, we can, from the surface of the particle, determine the contact angle even in different areas of that particle. Yes, we can do that. Uh, and you can say, you know, this region here has a higher contact angle, this re region here has lower contact angle. Overall, this particle surface has the average contact angle of X degrees. We can do that. Yeah, well, both that's fine. Yes, but, but not, yeah, okay, not the, 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 the whole particle. Right. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't answer for it. I think we might have to... Um carry this one on outside as we've just gone over our time limit. But uh, I'd like you all to join me once again in, in thanking Dr. Susanna Greek. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next week, we have Professor Kevin Galvin from the University of Newcastle, who is the event, inventor of the reflux classifier. And he'll be speaking on how this widely used beneficiation technology is being deployed in minerals processing and how it can work in conjunction with other emerging technologies to increase process efficiency. Hope you can all join us again next week for that talk. Thank you very much.